Hey everybody, uh, welcome to uh, another sermon, another uh, week. I just want to welcome everybody that might be watching this. Um, man, the time just continues to go on and I continue to miss you all dearly. And I look forward to the day we get to be back together. Um, but until then, we will continue to do this. Um, and just a couple of reminders, still no church until further notice. Um, I don't know when that's going to be. Hopefully it'll be soon. Uh, but I just don't know. Uh, so until then, we will still have sermons posted online on our Facebook pages or email. Um, and I just continue to reach out to me if you have prayer requests, if you have um, concerns, questions, uh, reach out to me. Uh, and I also want to encourage you, uh, make a phone call to um, somebody else in the church and just check to see how they're doing. Um, ask them how they're doing during this quarantine and just uh, catch up a little bit with them if you haven't had that opportunity. Um, we have to think of ways to, to continue to stay connected and, and still be the church, even in different times like this one. Uh, the other announcement I have is if you are looking to do something on Sundays because you can't go to church and you're looking for a drive-in service. Now, a drive-in service is where you drive in with your car uh, and you can roll down your windows, but you can't get out of your car. You can't use the bathroom. Uh, you can't get out and talk to people. You have to stay in your car but you kind of get to experience church. Uh, Monticello United Methodist on Sundays at 11 a.m. are having drive-in services until this pandemic is over. And so until we can start meeting again, they will every Sunday at 11 a.m. have a drive-in service. And so they want, uh, Brother Robbie uh, wants to invite anybody that wants to attend. It's gonna be in their back parking lot. Uh, I may even get to preach uh, here in uh, a few weeks. Um, but the only uh, caveat to that is that if it rains or there's bad weather, which there looks like there probably will be uh, rain this week, it will be canceled. And so if there's any kind of bad weather or rain, it's canceled. Um, but if it's good weather and you're looking for something to do on Sundays at 11 a.m., come out to Monticello United Methodist and, and experience a drive-in service. Um, I think that's all, all I have to, to tell you today. But uh, uh, I want to take a moment and pray with you all. Um, we want to continue just to remember those that are in public. We want to remember our leaders as they begin to figure out how do we reopen our economy and slowly reopen um, different things and regulations that need to happen. Um, because my deepest desire, and I'm sure most of you all, is how do we keep the most people safe? And uh, we want to do that as Christians. We want to represent Christ and, and love our uh, communities and love the most vulnerable people the best we can. So let's just continue to remember our leaders, continue to remember those that are having to work in the hospitals and with the public every single day. Um, there's a lot of people still out there that, that could catch um, lots of different sicknesses, but uh, let's remember them. Let's uh, remember our community. Our, um, we want to remember today those that maybe don't know Jesus. Uh, we want to pray for them. We want to pray uh, for God's blessing on us and our families um, and that he would have his will. So if you'll join me, let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, you are good. Um, Lord, we thank you for this time, even in the midst of a pandemic where we can still find you, we can still connect to each other. Um, Lord, so use this time to help us grow. Use this time to rest our bodies. Use this time to rest our minds and let us refocus our priority on you. Lord, we want to ask today for forgiveness. Forgiveness for the times that we failed you. Forgiveness for uh, our sin. Lord, forgiveness for our family sin. Lord, forgiveness for the sins of our church and our country. Um, Lord, we thank you so much for Jesus that paid the price. <laughs> that paid the price on the cross for that forgiveness. And so, Lord, today we want to say that we put our faith and our trust in him. God, we want to continue to pray for this pandemic. Um, everything that's going on, Lord, we ask that you be with the leaders and the healthcare uh, professionals and everybody that's making decisions on how we keep ourselves um, the safest and how we keep our hospitals from being over overwhelmed. Lord, um, be with the decision-making processes um, be with all those that are still working. Lord, we ask as we may have some family or friends or, or people we know that, that are dealing with the public every day of the week. Lord, we ask for their protection. We ask that you put your hand upon them and you guide and strengthen them. 
Lord, we want to ask that you're with people all across, not just this community or state, but across the, our country and across the world that are dealing um, with the effects of this pandemic, Lord, that are dealing with death and dealing with sickness and dealing with loneliness. Um, Lord, there is a lot of crisis going on right now, and so we turn to you as, as the king that sits on the throne, and we ask for your grace, and we ask for your mercy. Lord, um, continue to do work in your people. Continue to mold us and give us a desire to follow you. Lord, we thank you so much. Lord, please attend to all the needs in our hearts, the needs in this community, and let us be the hands and the feet of Christ. And Lord, now we pray the prayer you taught your disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. All right, now... I want to go ahead and jump into our scripture today. Um, if you missed last week or you forgot, um, I'm starting. I started last week doing a, a four-week series where we look at different moments Jesus had after the resurrection. And so he was killed on a Friday. He raised up on a Sunday. And if you read the Gospels, he has some interactions with different people after he's raised from the dead. And I want to look at those. And really ask ourselves, what can we learn from this? And this series I've kind of been calling From Death to Life. Because that's what happened to Jesus. He was dead, and then he was raised from the dead. And uh, now that we can experience a resurrected Christ, that we put our faith and our hope in a, a God that is living, we can also go from death to life. And so I want to look at these different encounters and see what we can take um, for our own walk with Jesus. And so I'm going to be reading today in John chapter 21. John chapter 21, verses 4 through 14. John 21, verses 4 through 14. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, Children, do you have any fish? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. The disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment for he was stripped for work and threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish. And they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards off. When they got out on the land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and he took the bread and he gave it to them. And so with the fish, this was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. Thanks be to God for his word today. We live in a world where we are surrounded by things that tell us two things. On one side of the coin, coin, they tell us that we are superior. They tell you that you are so full of worth, that you truly can be somebody great. You have that potential inside of you. I just go to a bookstore and look down the aisles and the aisles of books, and you'll find dozens of self-help books that tell you just take the next 10 steps and you can be somebody great. They will take you from being inferior to superior. This new motivation or this new secret of how to love yourself and how to find purpose, and as long as you pay 9 dollars 
uh, you can find out how to truly be superior. Or if you think to, you turn to social media, a lot of times the, the latest thing that's been shared throughout um, Facebook hundreds or thousands of thousands of times is a, is a little uh, message that tells you, you are worth it. You have value. And it goes on and on. You can find things in our culture that tell us how superior we are, that we are, we are great people. And then on the other side of the coin, though, we are in a culture that will tear us down, that will tell us the exact opposite, that will tell us you're nothing, you're inferior, you're, you'll never be anything great. Again, turn on social media and you can easily find any someone that will attack your beliefs, your politics, your appearance, your opinions, and anything else in any way to let you know that you're inferior. Supermodels and actors and actresses remind us how unattractive we are. We go to church and we li or we listen to sermons online and we're reminded how bad we are morally. And culture, time and time again, will tear us down over and over and over again, reminding us that we're inferior. So I ask you the question today, which is it? Are we inferior or are we superior? And this is an important discussion that we have when it comes to our faith for a multitude of reasons. But we all, at some point, even preachers, have had the question pop into our minds, can God actually use me? Can God use me or am I inadequate? Am I inferior? Am I not good enough? Could I be a good enough vessel for God to, to do something great through? God, in, in your eyes, am I inferior or am I superior? And I think when these questions come and they rest on our minds, I think we either fall on one side of the coin or the other. I think we either fall on the side of the coin that says, you know what? I am superior. I am good enough. And really, God needs me. Because the ministry I'm doing, it it, it hangs on me. As it, 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 I must do this ministry or it won't happen. All right? People sometimes feel this way if, if they're a major leader in the church and will have thoughts like, this church wouldn't run without me. Powerful and successful pastors and sometimes not even successful pastors get Messiah complexes where they either consciously or unconsciously believe they are saving people and that people really need them. And I think maybe the most common thought we have of, with ourselves being superior is that when we think we're superior, we start to look down on people we believe that are inferior. I'm better than those people because I read my Bible. I never miss a Sunday church and I go to Bible study. I don't do the bad sins. I have my life together. Therefore, I am superior to those who are not to my status. I am better than others. I've had success. Therefore, I'm superior. But on the other hand, I think we can fall on the other side of the coin as well. When I start to think, can God use me? Sometimes we fall on the line of, no, God, you know what? I'm inferior to others. God, how could you ever use me? I don't know enough about the Bible to share my faith. I have not been educated in the Bible like the preacher or the missionary. I even haven't even been a Christian very long. So what do I really even know? I am bad. If I could just be like so-and-so in the church, the, the person that's, you know, uh, volunteering and, and answering questions at Bible study and the person that's there every Sunday, if I could be like so-and-so, I would be doing something great because I'm sure they're really filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, God, I must just be missing something because I look at myself in the mirror and see how everyone else 
is better than me. I've tried and I've failed. Or I've been even too scared to try because I know if I try, I would fail. And therefore, I am inferior. And I think it would be easy just to end with that. Those who have success are superior and they should just continue doing what they're doing and, and they will be great. And those that don't have success are inferior. You are what you are. And if you're inferior, you just need to try harder. You just need to do a little bit more and maybe, just maybe, you could make something of yourself. But I think this just scratches the surface. Again, let's look back at these ideas of feeling superior or inferior. First, again, let's start with if you feel superior. And I can talk from this position, I think, the easiest because this position I found myself in most of my life. I felt su superior to others because others were worse than me. They didn't have the success I had. I didn't sin like them. You see, this is actually the same kind of line of thinking as the Pharisees. Those that feel superior, feel superior because they have a clean outward appearance. They do enough right things to make sure everyone else knows they have it together. But ultimately, and I want you to hear this, ultimately what a feeling of superiority does is cover up the deep-seated inferiority. It is just a cover or a band-aid for how inferior we actually are. And just like Jesus told the, the Pharisees that though they may clean their outside, their inside is full of wickedness. So too are those that project superiority, sometimes even without knowing it, but they have a deep-seated inferiority of wickedness and sin. Now let's flip the coin again. Maybe you're out there and you are someone that tends to feel more inferior. You feel like you're just not good enough for God. Maybe you've had thoughts of how could God ever use me? Others are really so much better than me. You see, this inferior inferiority comes from a deeper place than I think just a fear and, and more of from a deeper place than even I tried and I failed. I think this inferiority, this inadequacy, this I'm not good enough, comes from looking within oneself and seeing that you are actually sinful and wicked. How could God use me? Do you know my past? <laughs> my cup's just not dirty on the outside. My cup is also dirty on the inside. I am wretched. I could never be good enough for God. And so if we take both sides of this coin here, those that feel better than others and those that feel uh, inferior to others, if we go back to our original question of are we inferior? The answer is yes. And the more we look inward and focus on ourselves, the more we become aware of our shortcomings and inability to fix ourselves. Now, I, I assume you're asking by this point, what does this have to do with our scripture? And I am, I am here now. Uh, I, I want to just remind you what happened in our story today. So in our story, the disciples have fished all night. They definitely had a feeling, I guarantee it, of inferiority. They were fishermen. Uh, before they were with Jesus, they were fishermen. So this was would have been what they've known. And they fished all night, and they'd caught nothing. And then they Jesus is on the shore, and he says, Hey, just cast your net to the other side, to the right side. And they cast their net, and their net overflows with fish. And pretty soon... Um, our scripture says the beloved disciple, but in the book of John, that is John referring to himself. So John, the disciple, says that is Jesus. 
And as soon as Peter hears that it is the Lord, it is Jesus, he puts on his outer coat, he jumps in to the, to the water, he swims to shore, and he runs to Jesus. They get then to the shore, the disciples catch up, and they eat breakfast together. And it's this great scene of Jesus eating with his disciples. But I want us to turn us back here to our scripture, because there's something that I think is often missed. If we look at John chapter 21, I want us to read verses 9 and 10. There's a, an oddity here, and I think we, we miss it sometimes. We, I'm going to read this again. Verse 9, it says, When they got out on the land, they saw a charcoal fire in place, with fish laid out on it and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you have just caught. Okay, so what is so odd about that? Jesus has breakfast prepared. He has fish. He has bread. He's set it up. He's cooking. And then they come up and Jesus says, now bring some of that fish so I can, so we can have breakfast. Um, what's so odd here is that Jesus already had fish on the fire. So why would he need the disciples to bring more fish? And if we know anything about Jesus, we know he can take um, two fish and feed thousands. Uh, he fed the 4,000. He fed the 5,000 with very little fish. So we know Jesus doesn't need a lot of fish to feed a lot of people. So why does Jesus ask for their contribution, ask for their fish, if he already had fish on the fire? And I got to thinking about this, and it came into a clear picture that Jesus didn't need what they had, but he wanted it. Jesus didn't need their contribution, the fish they could bring to him, but he wanted to use it. You see, this is the gospel truth that will free us from our inferior selves. God does not need what you can contribute. He doesn't need it, but God wants it. God wants to use what you have. You see, Jesus, who beat sin and conquered death, has now come to bring freedom from our inferior selves. Because of the resurrection, because we serve a resurrected, a live Jesus, we now have the Holy Spirit living within us who makes us superior. Not because of anything I can do or how good I can be or how good you can be, but because of who Christ is and what he did. How is it, though, that Jesus is our superiority? How, how, well, what does that even mean? And if we start to think about what truly makes us inferior, it's our sin. It's the fact that I couldn't live up to the law. You couldn't live up to the law. The Israelites, we read stories and about stories and about stories that nobody could live up to God's perfection. Nobody could follow all the rules. Nobody could be good enough to have a relationship with God. But there was one man named Jesus who lived up to the law. He fulfilled the law and then he was the ultimate sacrifice. And so through Jesus' perfection, and now my faith and your faith in Jesus, we now get Jesus' superiority in spite of our inferiority, in spite of our inadequacies, in spite of our shortcomings, in spite of our sin. We get to experience being superior through Jesus' actions, through his death, his life, his death, and his resurrection. And so what do we need to do? And I got to thinking about this story, and what we need to do is we need to be like Peter. We need to be like Peter, and as soon as Peter heard that it was Jesus on the shore, he didn't care about anything else, but he ran to the shore. He swam to the shore to get to Jesus. We need to have that kind of mentality in life. We need to be people that prioritize Jesus, that we want to run and we want to get to Jesus as soon as possible because the truth is, I couldn't, I couldn't live up to the law. The truth is, I can't lead my family in a godly way. 
I can't lead people to growth and into a relationship with God. I can't beat my sin. I can't beat addiction. I can't, I cannot be superior, but I know a man who can, and that man is Jesus and he lives in me. And so while I may be inferior, Jesus is my superiority. And when we run to Jesus and when we have our faith in Jesus, then how does this change us? And again, I want to look at the two sides of the coin. If you are someone that tends to feel inferior, that you're not as good as other people, what can it do to know Jesus? What can it do to know Jesus? And what it can do is Jesus can come in and show you the gifts he has given you and that he wants to use that you can then turn around and you can say, you know what, I can share my faith. You know what, I can lead my family in a godly manner. I can start a ministry. I can volunteer because though I may be weak, Jesus is strong and it is he who works through me. And on the other hand, if you tend to feel like you're better than others, even if you don't consciously feel that, but you have kind of a, superiority um, towards others, one thing you might have to do is get off your high horse. You see, what Jesus can do for you is he can help you realize that your success comes from God and not you. If you remember in our story, Jesus wanted the contributions of the disciples, the, the fish that they had caught, but that was the very fish that, that Jesus allowed them to catch. And so their success in the story, their superiority, their, their, um, the, the goodness that they had came and was the source. Uh, Jesus was the source. And so what Jesus can do for you is he can remind you that God is the source of your superiority. Another thing Jesus will do for us is he will begin to let us look at the broken drug addict sinner on the street and we begin to realize that you know what I you are just as broken as they are that they need Jesus just as much as you do and that that you need Jesus just as much as them and you begin not to judge or look down on them otherwise I want to conclude today by imploring you to run to Jesus, to swim to Jesus as fast as you can. And though we may be inferior, inadequate, not good enough because of our sin, there was an empty tomb to prove God is superior and he wants to use you. Will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you that you save us from ourselves. You save us from our selfishness. You save us from our sin and our inferiority. And Lord, so I want I ask that you remind us today that, that you give us a Holy Spirit that makes us something great. You give us a Holy Spirit that makes us able to do so much more than we could ever thought. And that it has nothing to do with us and has everything to do with Jesus. Lord, we give you our faith, we give you our hope, and we thank you that you loved us enough to die for us. And we pray this now in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. All right, have a good week. Um, again, if you need anything, reach out to me. But uh, thanks for listening. Have a good week.